Glad to be with all of you guys. And so I'm going to read uh, the text that we've been talking about uh, this series. We're going to continue this series on finishing the fight. Uh, obviously, we started it with our conference, uh, and we believe that uh, it's something that's very viable for every believer is that uh, it's not how you start, it's how you finish. And there's a lot of people that start well, but don't finish well. In fact, the Bible is filled with men and women of God that started well, but somehow they got detoured or they got distracted and things got them away from God and they didn't end up finishing well. But I pray today that we will finish well. So I'm going to read the scripture that Paul wrote, kind of the theme scripture here out of 2 Timothy chapter 4. It says, don't be afraid of suffering for the Lord. Work at telling others the good news. This is the gospel. And fully carrying out the ministry God's given you. As for me, Paul is saying, my life's already been poured out as an offering to God. The time of my death is near. He knew he didn't have long to live. But he said these words, I fought the good fight. I have finished the race. And I've remained faithful. That's finishing well. So, Father, let's pray. Father, we thank you today for the Holy Spirit. We thank you for your grace, God. I pray for all the people that are sitting here today, those that are watching online. I just speak the blessing and the grace over them today. Open their hearts today to receive your word. Pray for the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And I declare truth in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. If I can say this for those of you that have children in school. I know they already started school, uh, but you can still bring them on Wednesday night. They're going to be okay. You know, they stay up a little later on Wednesday. I know how we get into this mode. We've had children. I have many of the pastors here have their children. Uh, so what happens when the food school year starts, everybody on Wednesday says, oh, yeah, I'm going to keep my kid. He needs to sleep. He's going to be okay. He's going to grow up fine. Uh, a little bit of, you know, just, you know, they stay up a little later that Wednesday. They'll be okay. Is that okay? So I just want to make sure to encourage you, uh, don't, don't keep them home on Wednesday. Bring them to church, and then right after church, just go home, whatever you got to do. You know, maybe take a nap. I don't know. Do whatever you got to do. But uh, let's continue to, uh, I think church does them a lot more good than a lot of junk out there, right? And so in the scripture uh, that Paul the Apostle is talking about, I mentioned this in conference, that he was near his death, and he's writing to his son in the faith by the name of Timothy, and he's telling him that I don't have long to live, but remain faithful, finish the fight. And here's what I want to say to you. Many people don't want to acknowledge this fight. Many people don't want to acknowledge this struggle. In fact, many preachers today and many churches today don't really preach about the fight and the battle that we're in as believers. In fact, they make Christianity look like it's just a walk in the park. That basically it's easy. And what many times is explained that Jesus has done everything. And as a result, we don't need to do anything. Jesus suffered for us. He died. He redeemed us completely. We must only believe in the finished work. And then by doing that, we will automatically live an overcoming life. And the fruit of the Spirit will automatically come. Well, that's hogwash. I don't see that in the Bible because Paul gives us the reality that Christianity is a fight. Yeah, Jesus did complete and finish the work, and we know that, but our lives are still being sanctified. We are still facing an enemy that's trying to divert us from the truth. In fact, if we read Ephesians chapter 6, uh, Paul the apostle lays it out very clearly, and he says, finally, my brothers, be strong in the Lord. And in the power of his might, he said, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For our fight is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Now, when I read that, that sounds like we're in a fight. That sounds like we're in a battle. In fact, we're fighting a fight, that, uh, an invisible enemy, an enemy you cannot see, but yet 
is very real. Uh, that tells me that uh, our faith in God doesn't automatically happen, that we just kind of sit around and we just let God do all the work and, and there's not going to be a fight or a battle, but it's incredibly important that you realize as believers there is a spiritual battle that you're fighting every day. In fact, you're in a war. Say, we're in a war. And we're in a war against the demonic strategies of the enemy. Now, I'm going to be very upfront. People will question, why, why do we need to talk about this fight? Why do we need to talk about the devil? Why do we even need to mention Satan? Because the number one thing that we find in the Bible, uh, the Bible talks about Satan. In fact, from the beginning of the Bible, Genesis to Revelation, it mentioned Satan. Uh, Jesus made reference to Satan. Uh, he described him as an enemy, and he describes him as a deceiver. And today, I want to talk about Satan being your deceiver. He is a liar. I said he's a liar. He is the master of deception. He knows how to deceive people. In fact, one of the greatest masquerades that he's got going on, one of the greatest illusions that he puts on is he makes people believe or he's convinced people that he doesn't exist. And so there's a lot of people that say, well, oh, the devil doesn't exist. That is the, the biggest fake news you've ever heard in your life. Uh, he doesn't want you to believe he exists. Uh, therefore, you're not going to equip yourself. You're not going to be ready when the forces of darkness come against your life. And you're not going to be ready and prepared. Uh, this is why you need to understand that the battles that you fight every day, it, the Bible said it's not flesh and blood, but it's a spiritual fight. So uh, you're not fighting the battle with your mother-in-law, right? With your ex, right? With your teenager, right? It, it, it's against the demonic forces of hell. It says against uh, principalities and power. So let me just give you a bit of background of who Lucifer is or who Satan is. Let me give you the backstory, and I'll do it really quick. In Isaiah chapter 14, it says, it says, Lucifer, how you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. For you said in your heart, I will ascend into heavens, and I will raise my throne above the stars. So if you know any history uh, in the word of God, the Bible describes Lucifer as an angel, as a beautiful angel. In fact, he was in charge of worship. But what caused him to fall was pride. Isn't that funny that pride is probably one of the greatest hindrance of mankind today? Pride says, I don't need God. Pride says, I could do it by myself. Pride says, I got it together. Pride said, you know, it's all about me, myself, and I. Someone say amen. amen. And so he fell into sin, uh, or he positioned himself against God because he wanted the throne of God. But how many know the throne of God is not a couch? Uh, it's only one sits on that throne, and that's God. And so the Bible says one-third of all the angels uh, came, or he's able to convince. He's been a deceiver from the beginning. He's able to convince all of these angels uh, to leave heaven. They were cast down from heaven. And today, because of that, the devil hates God, and he hates those that stand for God. That's why it's important that we equip ourselves. It's important that we understand the battle that we're fighting. The things that you're dealing with, it's not a coincidence. It is a spiritual fight. C.S. Lewis said this, there's no neutral ground in the universe. Every square inch, every split second is claimed by God. But on the counterclaim, it's also claimed by Satan. This is why the devil comes against you. We're calling him the deceiver because Jesus called him the deceiver. In John chapter 8, verse 44, I want you to read this with me. He said this. Uh, he said, the devil was a murderer. In other words, he's an assassin. From the beginning, not holding the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language for he is the liar and the father of lies. So when he says he's the father of lies, he is the inventor of lies. We often say, who invented this? Can I tell you who invented the lie? The devil did. He's the inventor of lies. He is the master 
deceiver. We know that Jesus is the truth. But the devil, there is no truth in him. He holds no truth at all. He is what we call back in the day a con man. How many have ever met a con man before? Back in the neighborhood, you meet a con man. He, he, man, you've been conned. Yeah, he, he's the kind of guy that will come to the gas station while you're pumping gas, and he says, man, I got these 70-inch TVs for $350. Somebody know what I'm talking about. And, and, and you've been conned. And they're wrapped in plastic, and, and, and you look real, and you open the top of the box, and, and you can see the black frame. You go, man, I got me a good deal for 300 bucks. Then you get to your house only to find out that you got two pieces of plywood. Uh, you've been conned. Am I right? Somebody say amen. <laughs> That's actually a true story by someone. I won't mention who they are. But here, here is the devil's strategy. He's attacking us. He's sitting on the right side. But we're attacked <laughs> by the devil loves to attack, attack us. And this is what the devil does. He attacks the authority of God's word. That's one of the first ways that he operates is he attacks the authority of God's word. He did this in the very beginning with Eve. He began to attack the authority of God's word. Now think of all the different ways the devil could have attacked Eve. He could have attacked, he could have attacked her insecurity. He could have said, you know what, uh, uh, you know, he could have attacked her feelings, you know, and, and, and all of a sudden, uh, you know, he could have said, you know, Adam is tired of your feelings. He's tired of you, you know, of all your wants. You know what? He wants to go in his man cave. He, did, he doesn't want to be around you. Uh, uh, you know, it, it, he thought it was better just for him and the animals, but now he's got, he wants his rib back. He, he's tired of this. He could have done that, but instead he attacked God's word. Now write this down. The first thing the deceiver did was he questioned God's word. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 1 says, The serpent said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from the tree in the garden? Now you notice, he didn't, he didn't question whether God had spoken it. He didn't deny that God had spoken it. He questioned what God had spoken. This is what the devil does. He plants seeds of doubt. Is the word of God really is, that, is the Bible really God's word? I mean, surely you're smarter than to believe God created everything. I mean, you're, you're, you, you're into, you know, you're, you're an intellectual. You believe that, you know, everything came from a big bang, exploded, and everything came into order, right? You're not naive to think that someone actually created the world. And this is how the devil begins to operate. Now, God didn't really mean this for you. I mean, we're in 2023. You don't really, I mean, we've evolved, you know. We're a modern culture today. You know, a lot of those things are ancient. Man, God loves you. You can do whatever you want to do. And this is how the devil works. He, he begins to question God's word. And Eve, to a point, when he began to question God's word, he got Eve to begin, apparently, when you read into it, it looks like Eve begins to question God's word too. Because in Genesis chapter 2, when God originally speaks to Adam and Eve, he says, of every tree of the garden, you may freely eat. But of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in that day you eat it, you shall what? Surely die. So God said, you can have everything in the garden. Everything is yours, except that one tree. Don't, don't, don't eat that. You can freely Eat anything you want. Say freely. In other words, it's open to you. You got the freedom to do whatever you want. So when the devil began to question the word of God and Eve began to have this conversation, she leaves out one key word. The woman said to the serpent, we may eat, uh, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden. She left out the word freely. Maybe it's implying perhaps that Eve was saying to herself, maybe God is holding back on me. Maybe I'm not as free as I thought I was. Maybe she was saying, you know what, if I eat of the tree of knowledge, maybe that's going to bring me fulfillment. You know what, uh, what, what happens is when we begin to question 
that God is holding back on us. Can I just tell you one thing? You begin to question the goodness of God. You start to question the goodness of God. The moment you begin to question the goodness of God, it's easier to disobey the will of God. The moment you think you're entitled for other things, you're entitled, you deserve more, you're worthy of more, you think you should have more than what God's already given you, you're questioning the goodness of God. Can I tell you, the deceiver's lie has already entered your heart. Can I just make a note of this kind of step into the future because the deceiver always works the same? I, I want to mention this story about Judas in Luke chapter 22, verse 2. Look at what it said, that the chief priest and the teacher of the law were looking for some way to get rid of Jesus, for they were afraid of the people. And then it says this, Satan entered Judas. Another translation said, Satan entered the heart of Judas, called Iscariot, one of the twelve, and Judas went to the chief priest and the officers of the temple guard and discussed with them how he might betray Jesus. See, the deceiver will always get you to betray God, he always get you to question the goodness of God. They were delighted and agreed to give him money. He consented and watched for an opportunity to hand Jesus over to them when no crowd was present. Now I want you to take note of what's going on here. The chief priest and the law and the teacher of the law, they were looking for a way to get rid of Jesus. And the Bible says Satan entered the heart of Judas. Judas. In other words, the chief priests were looking for a way to get rid of Jesus, uh, but Satan didn't enter him, them. Satan entered the heart of Judas. Isn't it ironic to think that he was one of the 12 disciples? He was the one that had walked with Jesus, yet he's the one that was deceived. He's the one that, uh, that the enemy used to betray Jesus, and it wasn't the religious people. The Bible says that Judas approached the priests. They didn't approach him. He came to them. In other words, the devil knows how to influence us the same way many times, but in a deceitful way as God influences us. Judas went to the chief priests and officers of the temple guard to discuss with them how he might betray Jesus. So they didn't solicit him. They didn't make him an offer. Because let me just tell you something. To Judas, Jesus was not enough. The goodness of God was not enough. Following Jesus was not enough. So he traded Jesus away for 30 pieces of silver. How did he lure him in? This is, this is really deceiving when you think, how was Judas leered in? I mean, he had seen the miracles of God. He'd seen him feed the 5,000. He'd seen him do miracles, raise the Lazarus from the dead. In fact, when you read the scripture in one of the other gospels, uh, when Judas deceives or when Judas betrays Jesus, it's right after the miracle of Lazarus being raised from the dead. How could it be? Many of us would question, how could Judas... Uh, it doesn't even seem logical. In fact, it seems illogical that Judas would be the one that would betray Jesus. I mean, it's not good to betray anyone, but to betray Jesus? I mean, you've seen him do the miracle. You knew Jesus' motives and his heart were right. You knew he was in it for the right reason. But yet somehow, the enemy was able to deceive him. See, when you're deceived, there's, any, there's nothing no one can do. There's not enough someone can give you. There's nothing anyone can tell you. Because when we're thinking, man, it's not logical, but let me just tell you, the devil's illogical. When you're deceived, you're illogical. You've been leered in by the enemy in the same way that Eve was leered in. The moment Satan started to question God's word... The moment Satan started to question what God was saying, Eve was deceived. The moment Judas began to question the goodness of God, he was deceived. 
Listen to this. The second thing that deceived Eve was he twisted God's word. The serpent said, you won't surely die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. Here is what's interesting to me is how many know we're already made in the image of God. She was already a reflection of God's heart, and yet the serpent loves to twist and twist. Did God really say this? Did God really do this? Did God really say uh, that you, you shouldn't sin? Did God really say that you should stay away from this? Uh, you know, God loves you. you. God loves you so much. You should be, you know, don't let people judge you. You need to be happy. Yet we forget God says you need to be holy too. See, all of us today, you need to be careful. You're under attack. You're fighting a spiritual battle. There is a deceiver that's trying to get into your life, trying to get into your home. Now, I don't know about you, but if there was someone that broke into my home and, and it broke into your home and you have children, and, and if they broke into your home, are, are you going to sit in your bedroom and say, man, I just hope they don't go down the hallway where my kids are at? <laughs> Honey, what are you going to do? You know? I don't know about you, man, but all of a sudden, if the enemy came into my home, if somebody broke in my home, I'm going to be a combination of Jason Bourne and that guy from Taken. I don't know what his name, Brian, whatever it is. I have these skills I've learned over time. You know, I will find you. I'll pursue you, right? That type of thing. I mean, all of a sudden, man, I'm going to become the martial art, you know, uh, weaponry. I'm going to use the lamp. I'm going to use whatever I can. And I'm going to fight. I said, I'm going to fight. And I'll tell him, man, if I die, I'm going to come back, and I'm going to raise up from the dead. I'm coming back. I'm going to get you, man. I'll bite, I'll chew, I'll get you back, right? Why? Because the enemy has broken into your home. How come we don't fight that way for Jesus Christ in your life, man, and begin to do battle and realize the Bible says in Ephesians 6, put on the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith, the belt of truth, and then it gives us one offensive weapon, and that is the sword of of the spirit. The only offensive weapon that you have is the sword of the spirit. In other words, the word of God is your greatest weapon. It's the greatest weapon that you have against the enemy. Now, here's what I want you to realize. When they were, uh, when he talks about this armor, he's talking about like a Roman soldier had this armor and he had a large sword, but he actually had two types of sword, one that was long and one that was shorter. And the shorter sword was known as the two-edged uh, sword, and it was known as the gladius. In other words, uh, it was able to, uh, 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 easier to handle. You remember when uh, David cut the head, off, head of Goliath that he drew his big sword and he cut his head off. But he's talking about, Paul he is talking about the shorter sword. This is the two-edged sword that many of the gladiators had. This was their second sword, and that second sword was the two-edged sword. It was able to maneuver that, and this is what the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, tells us, for the word of God is alive, it's active, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. Now, so how do we fight against the enemy? You fight the enemy with the sword, which is the word of God. Now, if you remember in the book of Matthew and many of the Gospels, it talks about how Jesus went into the wilderness and he did battle against the devil. Now, we know that Jesus went into the wilderness to fast and pray. He was there seeking the face of God. He was taking some time denying himself of physical nutrition and so how many know that uh, when you haven't eaten a while, you, you're weak? I mean, all it takes for me is to skip a meal, and I'm grumpy. I mean, I'm just like, I need to eat, man. I, I, you know, all that, God bless you. We, where, where are we going to eat? That's, we need to do that right now. That needs to happen. 
Don't ever go to Costco when you're hungry because you will buy everything. Don't ever go to the market when you're hungry. Man, I'm telling you, I said, oh, yeah, that looks good. Oh, yeah, let's get that. Yeah, put that in the basket. We, we're we're going to eat all that today, <laughs> right? So when you haven't eaten, you're probably at your most vulnerable physical moment. And this is when the devil attacks Jesus, and he comes to him because he knows Jesus is weak. He knows that Jesus is fasting, and this is when he attacks you. See, when you're bold in faith, uh, this is when the devil, man, uh, he, he begins to keep his distance. Uh, when you begin to put God first, things begin to change. You say, well, the devil hasn't attacked me in a while. Well, maybe you're not doing much. So wave number one, when Jesus is in the wilderness, uh, the devil comes to him, and he says, why don't you turn these stones uh, into bread? Or the OLV version, the Omar Lopez version says, why don't you turn these stones into Randy's Donuts, you know, or uh, biscuits and gravy, right? Why don't you turn these stones into that right now? Somehow, again, he's uh, coming to Jesus at his weakest moment. And what did Jesus do? He drew his sword. He says, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Here is Jesus using the sword to fight back against every lie and deception of the enemy. Number two, wave number two, the, the Bible says that Satan began to, took him to a cliff. And he says, why don't you throw yourself down from this cliff? And he says, because I, the devil quotes the scripture, but he twists it a little bit. He says, the angels will get charge over you, and they will come and rescue you, but Jesus says, it is written, you shall not put the Lord God to test. You're not going to test God. I'm not going to test God. And then the enemy took him up to all the kingdoms, or he took him above this pinnacle to look at all the kingdoms, and Satan said, man, if you bow down and worship me, then I'll give you all of these things. And Jesus said, you should worship the Lord God and him alone. Get away from me, Satan, because I'm here to tell you that the sword, the word of God, God is your weapon against the enemy today. And the reason I say that today is because there's a lot of people in the kingdom, there's a lot of people in church that you don't know the word of God. In fact, if I said, you know, where's your Bible today? They go, what? It's, it's, you know, it's on my phone. But, you know, it's not as accessible as Instagram and, and TikTok. You, you got it in a folder somewhere. How come you don't have it right openly? How come it's not the first one? How much do you really know your Bible? Well, you know, it's in the back of the trunk of the car. It's on a bookshelf somewhere. How available is the Word of God? How much do you know God's Word? David said in Psalms 119, I have hidden your Word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Before the Word can come out of your mouth, it has to be hidden in your heart. See, if the only time you read the Bible, the only time you get the Word of God is in church, that's not enough. I said, that's not enough. You need to know the Scripture yourself. You need to know the Word of God yourself. The reason why we get leered in, we get so deceived, is because you don't know God's truth. You don't take some time to open the Word of God. You don't take some time. See, we, we've got to seek God first. How many know worship and prayer is number one? Coming to the house of God, giving to God, getting into his word. When you get in the word of God, man, it will, what did God's word do? The word of God convicts us when we stray away. So when you got word, God's word, when you start straying away, you get the conviction. God's word directs us to do God's will. God's word comforts us when we're hurting. God's word encourages us when, we're, when we need it. God's word equips us uh, to do God's word, and God's word reminds us of things when we've gone astray. Can you say amen? amen? This is God's word, so let it become 
part of your life. In other words, when things are coming against you, when there seems to be things that are happening that you don't understand, you've got to begin to go in the Word of God. You've got to remind yourself what does God's Word say. When you're feeling a little depressed, when you're feeling a little down, you go to the Word of God. Why so downcast? Oh, my soul. I put my hope in the living God. When the, it seems like the devil's attacking your family, you say, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. When you think you can't make it another day, I will not grow weary in doing well. For in due season, I will reap what I sow. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Me, uh, when the diagnosis is not good, uh, when they've given you a bad report, uh, I believe by his stripes I am healed. Uh, amen. When I'm not sure what I'm going to do today, I will trust in the Lord with all of my heart uh, and lean not on my own understanding, uh, but in all my ways acknowledge him uh, and he will direct my path. Uh, when I'm feeling a shame. There is no condemnation in those that are in Christ Jesus. I've been redeemed by the blood of Jesus. If I confess my sin, God is faithful to cleanse me of all my sin. See, this is God's word. This is God's power in your life. But if you don't know it, you can't quote it. If you don't live it, it does has no power in you. Thank you for coming to church. Thank you for being here. But that's not going to give you power over the enemy in your life. You got to put on the whole armor of God. You got to get all of God's word in your life. You got to begin to live this truth out. Here's the thing. We think this is just a casual thing. See, when the church is something you go to, then it's never going to change you. The church should be something you are. I am the church. I am part of the church. Church is not a place I go to. Church is who I am. Man, it's not something that I'm looking for. It's something that's already in me. Can you say amen? See, when you think about God and who he is, when you think about the power of God, so many of us, we have this, this image of God. We have this image of Jesus, you know, with a sheep over his shoulder and, and, or, or, you know, with his long hair and all of this. And I, I get all of these images. That's one image of Jesus. But you also have to know that Jesus is not just a savior, but he's also Lord of our lives. He's also the king of kings and Lord of lords. And not only does he love us, but he's also, Jesus does love people, but he's also going to judge people. And if you're not living right today, there's judgment coming your way. Look at what Revelation 1 says. His head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow. His eyes were like flames of fire. His feet were polished like bronze, refined in the furnace. His voice thundered like mighty ocean waves. Weaves, and he held stars in his right hand. Say it with me, everybody. He says, his sharp two-edged sword came from his mouth. What is that to it? That's the word of God. That's the power of God. So, friend, when people see Jesus, he's not going to be this sweet little shepherd uh, with the sheep over his shoulder, but he's going to be king of kings and lord of lords, and you better be ready to meet him today. You better be ready to know who he is. This is why we need to begin to walk in his power today. This is why we need to finish the fight. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I've said it many times, and I'll say it again, and I don't say it out of ignorance. I'm saying it out of truth. I love you. I thank you guys for coming to the church, but I'm not serving God because of you. My walk with God is personal. I intend to start this fight and finish it to the day I die. That, that's my intention, whether you do it or not. I'm trying to bring direction. I'm trying to encourage you and tell you that he'll make the difference in your life. I'm trying to tell you that if you'll fight, you can make it. That if you stop playing games, God will make a difference in your life. 
But if Christianity is some casual thing you kind of go to, then you're going to be in a struggle every day. You're always going to be struggling. You've got to make up your mind who you're going to serve. I made up my mind a long time ago, I'm going to serve God. I'm not going to play with them. I'm not going to compromise. I've seen people do it, and I just see them leered away. The enemy easily deceives them. They fall for this. They fall for that. And there, there's no consistency over their life. You've got to get consistent with your walk with God. You've got to allow God's word to fill you. You've got to be God's word to be part of you and in you. So I'm going to pray for you today. Why don't you bow your heads and close your eyes.